Um, there is this goal of, or the, the real opportunity to knit existing programs together and use our resources more efficiently, especially in these economic times. And I think there is this reality that how decisions are, there's a real mismatch between how decisions are made, which Shelley uh, brought up, that a lot of HUD resources go straight to localities where, while our transportation dollars either go straight to the state and then are funneled to the regions or they go to regional agencies. So there's this, there's this mismatch between really fostering regionalism when the decisions and how the money is directed is not necessarily facilitating that, so we're going to touch on that. And we did just have this round of grant applications, and what we're hearing is that this has been a really uh, interesting process for regions in response to the HUD um, request uh, for proposals. Um, well, I think you know after our initial uh, gasp at you know, the amount of information that HUD was asking for in the application, which also coincided with a state level uh, grant through our California Strate Strategic Growth Council um, with very similar principles and goals in mind. I think we began to understand that there was really some genius behind the application that just going through the application process sort of forced us as a regional agency <laughs> When I say we, I should reference, we've been breaking down silos in the Bay Area for quite a few years, one of them being that there's my agency, the Association of Bay Area Governments, we're the Council of Governments. The MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Transportation, is, is MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Uh, there was a time when the two agencies didn't get along too well. Uh, we're, our programs and policies are now very much interrelated, and our work is as well. So we work together on this application. and. It really gave us an opportunity to, uh, for a few key staff people to carve out literally a couple of weeks uh, toward the end of August and assess where are we at, and we have a lot of programs and policies that are seen as pretty innovative, um, but what is still the huge gap that exists in our region, and this sort of gets to the point that Shelley made earlier of really getting to where people live, um, and I think for regions that are a little bit earlier on in terms of trying to construct a regional planning framework where the regional agencies don't have uh, land use authority, it's really important to go right to the local level. We then, four years ago, went at the ground level, spent a year-long process developing a structure for our what is now our regional blueprint plan. And if one compares the vision with our priority development areas and priority conservation areas, they look very, very similar strikingly similar, except the big difference was that we had buy-in for the latter. Um, and with incentives, we have local jurisdictions uh, coming to the table. We work closely with our 28 transit agencies uh, as best we can and with our nonprofit community for something that can really move things forward in a partnership fashion. Thanks, Ken. Jillian, do you want to touch on your experience in Portland? Sure. Um, well, first of all, Portland does have the only elected regional government uh, in the country, and that certainly has provided us with a forum and a lot of advantages in thinking regionally. Um, we have kind of a silo, though, that does deal with transportation, and then a silo that deals with land use planning, and they try to come together at the Metro Council level. And certainly what we found in our response to the Sustainable Community Partnerships opportunity was housing hasn't been a strong part of um, our planning. And I was just amazed. To me, the federal government often seems remote. Um, and I saw a mobilization in our region that was really astounding. Um, and we started meeting at 8 o'clock on Monday mornings back in uh, April to start preparing for this application and held several large meetings bringing in all kinds of housing providers and advocates to try and shape our application. And it really was a lot of work. What we'd like to do is understand, again, uh, on the ground kind of opportunity areas, areas where there are already good schools, good transportation, and maybe a lack of affordable housing, and then those areas that have infrastructure needs, education needs, and then take on, I think, the really hard work of changing our criteria for all kinds of infrastructure investments to have a more equitable outcome. 
Um, and I think the first step for us is going to be a common understanding of what equity means. Often in transit, um, especially among some of our suburban partners, equity is having you know just uh, lines on the map, um, bus lines serving the area, not really paying attention to what lines are effective. I mean, are people riding them? Um, and so this, if we're funded, and now we've created a big expectation among our housing providers, we'll have to find some other way to have this conversation. Um, but what we hope that the outcome is ultimately is a mobilization of a whole range of transportation um, and other infrastructure resources to better serve um, the low-income people in our community. And of course, we need to bring housing resources into that as well. So, and I heard this in some of the questions that were asked after Shelley spoke, is kind of around the mechanics of how this happens. Um, how have you broken down silos, or what do you think has been the, the driver, in maybe in your respective regions, for why people see the benefits or, of coming together? Um, I mean, wh- how are you doing it? What are the, can you identi- like share what are some of the persistent barriers to helping this happen? Um, can you touch on that a little bit? Maybe Jillian will start with, with you. Well, I mean, we're the region that meets, and so we have you know, a lot of interaction <laughs> that exposes one to you know, deficiencies in one discipline or another. Uh-huh. Um, and in fact, you know, people come to Portland and they stay in Portland, and I started my career um, in a nonprofit developing affordable housing. Um, and now I'm at the transit agency. So, you know, there's, you know, in the end, we're all just people in these silos, um, <laughs> and it's people who um, reach across and, and make the difference. Um, I would say, though, that cracking transportation funding um, and, and the limits on, on transportation funding, you know, We've made a lot of progress with discretionary transportation programs um, where we are, for example, we do have a, a TOD implementation program that is funded with transportation funds. And we do that because we know that the land use pattern, the development patterns have big impacts on transportation. They have transportation outcomes. Um, and that often it's much more effective use of funding to um, put land uses in the right places rather than adding capacity to roadways, you know, that just sort of fill up. A change uh, in land use and development patterns could have a a much more lasting transportation benefit and make people's lives better and improve the environment and, you know, stop us wasting so much money on on gas and so much time in transporting people. Climate change, greenhouse gases, and, and, and the real increase in awareness and acknowledgement of climate change as a problem um, essentially coincided with the housing boom collapse. And the housing boom hit us in a really, really big way. Um, we had you know, enormous growth in Silicon Valley through the dot-com. That then tapered off, and there were a lot of layoffs, but it also created a lot of wealth within certain segments of the community. And we had one of the most significant drive till you qualify um, dynamics playing out uh, of anywhere in the country uh, where people were moving an hour, an hour and a half away from their jobs in San Francisco's financial district or in Silicon Valley to find a house they could afford, oftentimes out of our region into the Central Valley, creating huge pressures on the roads and so forth. And when that was presented, even to some of our elected officials who really kind of like the Bay Area the way it is, they like their community how it is, that for a place that thinks of itself as a pretty smart place, this is not a very smart way to grow, um, I think some light bulbs went on. And the fact that that dynamic has now resulted in one of the steepest foreclosure rates in the country in those same communities where people moved really underscored that that's not a development approach that works. We tend to get in this conversation about transportation and housing, but as we all know, there are so many other components that make a community livable. Uh, President Obama uh, 
ma recently made an announcement about an infrastructure uh, source of funds. Um, but this idea that, you know, how we're going to finance all of these things and important amenities that knit, knit communities together, and it's not just a condo near a BART station. Um, are you thinking about that at, at the regional scale? And, and the other thing I just wanted to also dig in a little deeper is this is a conference on partners and innovation. Um, I don't think, Ken, you've really touched on the fact that you're a, a cog that is working very, very closely with your transit. I don't think most folks really understand how closely you're working with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in and crafting many of these um, regional policies. And maybe, Jillian, if you could touch on who your partners in innovation are in the Portland region, that might be helpful for folks um, trying to facilitate these things happening in their own regions. So it's kind of a two-part question. <laughs> sure. Well, um, we do work. I mean, the MPO and the COG, MTC and ABAG, work very, very closely together on virtually all of our policies at this point in time. We've been moving in a direction of really trying to connect transportation TOD funds to housing and where it happens. Um, Relative to the big pot of money, uh, which is streets and roads maintenance, um, and sort of the second biggest pot, transit expansion, relative to the former, uh, there wasn't the political support during the last RTP to condition any of that money to infill communities uh, that are taking on a lot of the heavy growth. And you know, honestly, the MTC, working with our staff, made a big push, and it, it, it didn't happen. Um, I think going forward through the sustainable community strategy process, these sorts of things will be part of the discussion. To be sure and mention is maybe kind of, I believe most people here are in the housing area, and I can open a little door crack to some of the transportation funding. Um, we've been very interested to see money, federal money, um, coming out you know, new NOFAs, Notice of Funding Availability, with the Livable Communities Partnership criteria overlaid on them. And I wanted to mention a couple of those. Um, one, there is a program 5309 that typically funds buying buses. Uh, and that had some leftover pot of money uh, that they issued, you know, a NOFA for, and they called it the, I think, Livable, livable Bus Program or something. And if you read it, you would think what you're supposed to do with this money is buy buses. And you kind of read along, and then there are two words that are very important in the transit area, and those are joint development. That joint development was an el eligible activity under this grant. And that kind of opens the door then to perhaps buy land, um, some other, you, you can do some pre development work, you can do. Um, some site preparation, that kind of thing. And um, it said that there was a priority for applications that were coordinated with public housing authorities. And then we have a housing authority going for a HOPE 6 grant for a uh, existing, obviously, public housing project that's in, it's in the city of Portland, but it's in a more suburban area. And the project is like down in a hole and it has no ADA accessible route to the bus line. And so we were proposing to acquire the land that was between the housing project and the transit street in, or in order for them to be able to make that connection as part of the HOPE 6 redevelopment.